today is the western coastline of Turkey was once the epicenter of the ancient Greek world. This region called Anatolia was the cradle of western thought and the birthplace of science and technology. The fact that it happened here was no coincidence. Several factors contributed to this first scientific view of the world. The ancestors of many of these locals here were Ionians, a Greek tribe that originated in the Peloponnesian Peninsula. The Ionians were expelled from their homes by a marauding seafaring people. With nowhere else to go, the Ionian emigrants landed here, some 300 miles to the east, on the opposite side of the Aegean, which now belongs to modern Turkey. Not surprisingly, forced migration had taken a toll, one that would soon become their asset. Adrift in a strange land, the Ionians had to abandon their beliefs and their ancestors. Over time, this generated a rather pragmatic, rational approach to life, because they could never be sure they wouldn't be driven out again. Having lost everything after fleeing their homeland, the Ionians focused on the future and welcomed new ideas, especially when they were good for business. Given their location, their trade and their harbors, the Ionians were happy to take practical ideas from anyone whether Egyptians or Babylonians, Persians or Mesopotamians. When their neighbors, the Lydians, invented coinage, the Ionians were the first to use it. And when the Phoenicians invented their alphabet, history took a new turn. Now they could record their own spoken language. So far, knowledge had been transferred orally from one generation to the next and from master to apprentice. But with the newly invented Phoenician alphabet, which the Ionians quickly adopted, they had acquired a tool for consistent record keeping and data collection. Information became more widely available, and another factor contributed to the birth of this new era. Up until that time, the world was believed to be ruled by gods, who expressed their anger through natural phenomena, filling the ancients with fear. But soon the Ionians shed their fears and dared the gods. These are the remains of a city that became the springboard for some of mankind's most amazing discoveries. In the 6th century BC, this was the center of the universe. This is Millet, ancient Miletus, the birthplace of science and technology. Perched on a hill, the horizon beckons. No longer tied down by their past and drawn to the practical, the Ionians must have heeded the call. I'd heard about one wealthy Miletan who traveled across the Mediterranean and made his hometown world famous. His name was Thales, and on his voyages, he gathered not only riches, but information. As far as we know, Thales was the first person to discover the laws of nature, which made him the first scientist and the founder of the natural sciences. His revolutionary observations and insights proved there was order in the world, not mere chaos created by a whim of the gods. During his travels, most notably to Egypt, Thales combined his own observations with those of others. His insights led him to believe that man was not at the mercy of God, but that instead nature operated like a mechanism, a machine that followed its own inherent laws. Laws make things predictable, and so Thales was eager to understand them. Experts believe that he collected data on the cycles of the stars, the moon and the sun from the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians. Thales discovered a pattern, and when he applied it to forecast a natural phenomenon, he became the first person in recorded history to predict an eclipse, which must have truly shocked the ancient world. Did this not prove that nature had laws that were not governed by the gods? Thales dared the gods and thereby demystified the world. 
He cast aside tradition by asking the critical question why in an effort to find underlying laws. This became the foundation of science. But Thales also proved that theoretical knowledge had practical value. Then as now, olives and olive oil were major export products in Ionia. Thales baffled his contemporaries when he predicted a particularly rich harvest, long before anyone else had a clue. To do that was as presumptuous as predicting the moods of the gods. And to show that he was serious, Thales bought all the olive presses in the area, way ahead of harvest time. We don't know how he did this, but his prediction came true. Now, all the farmers had to come to Thales to get their olives pressed and receive their first lesson in the value of science. The traditional lines and angles of the rich farmlands around Miletus surrounded Thales. Correlating this observation with similar patterns he'd seen on his journeys may have given him the idea to describe the world in systematic terms, looking for rules that worked in all cases. Egyptian building methods and ancient records relating to angles, triangles and circles may have motivated Thales to formulate his own geometric theories. Thales became the father of geometry. His discoveries form the core of modern science and technology, describing the underlying rules of the physical world. My next stop was Praini, a city just a few miles outside Miletus, where the Greeks took geometry literally to a whole new level. This is the most stunning piece of engineering. I can't believe anyone would want to build a town into a hillside. We wouldn't do it today, but for the Ionians, who had no cranes or machinery to cut away the rock, it seems the perfect example of how they used geometry to impose order on their world. In the 4th century BC, some 4,000 people are believed to have lived here. To organise the city and make it beautiful, the Greeks used a grid system. No one is quite sure how they created these city blocks. One theory says that city planners used a standard set square for the corners and extended the sides with cords and pegs. By measuring the diagonals of the resulting rectangle, they could establish that the blocks had equal sides. 2,500 years later, we still use the grid system defines most American cities and towns. But the Ionians applied the grid system ruthlessly, ignoring the steep slope to establish the city's layout along a north-south axis. This way they made use of the sun to warm the city in the winter while optimizing the city's air circulation to cool it in the summertime. That was awesome. Wandering through these ancient ruins, these broken columns, I marvelled at their perfection. In their search for the underlying rules of nature, the ancient Greeks discovered cosmos. Cosmos is a Greek word and a synonym for both order and beauty. What is awesome to us was cosmos to the Greeks. Much of this ancient world has been destroyed. What remains is a testament to the fundamental truths that were first formulated by Thales. Follow the course of science and technology to its next milestone across the Aegean to visit another truly groundbreaking site, one which in antiquity was considered a world wonder. It would have been impossible without the application of geometry. What had started with Thales was a new era in which the Greeks replaced myth and traditional dogma with a critical approach, asking the question why. Observation became more powerful than myth and the application of the rule, the final test. Now I'm in modern Greece, on the island of Samos, once one of the wealthiest islands in the Aegean Sea. Ancient Samos had a booming economy nourished by the sea. In the ancient town of Tigani, now named Pythagoreo after one of its most famous inhabitants, 
problem of securing sufficient drinking water for its citizens inspired one of the wonders of the ancient world. It lies inside this mountain. Believe it or not, they used geometry to build this tunnel. I'm in the Eupolinus Tunnel, named after the ingenious engineer who designed it. Around 522 BC, the ancients dug their way right through Mount Castro. Water was brought from the Agiades Spring to the northern mouth of the tunnel. About five and a half feet in diameter, it follows a 3,300 foot long course through solid limestone. But what's special is that it was dug from two sides. Nothing special, you may think, but it's fantastically unlikely that the two shafts would meet in the middle. A little further down there is the point where the two halves of the tunnel meet. Unfortunately, no records survive as to how Eupolinus did it. Today, most scientists agree with the theories of the famous hero of Alexandria, who lived in the second century AD. Here's how Hero said Eupolinus did it. Ancient engineers measured the distance around Mount Castro using right angles. All eastward distances, minus the westward ones, equaled one side of a right triangle. The sum of all north-south distances equaled the length of the second side, and the line connecting the two sides equals the proposed course of the tunnel. By sighting along smaller right triangles aligned at each entrance, Hero believed they used markers to maintain the tunnel's course. Unfortunately, the midsection of the tunnel where the two shafts meet was closed for fear of a cave-in. But I was told the precision of their measurements was astounding. It deviates by only about three feet vertically and 20 feet horizontally. I can't believe that just with picks, hammers and chisels, they dug out 250,000 cubic feet of rock. It's estimated it took them 10 years and 4,000 slaves to get it done. And where the water had to go was down there. From the southern mouth of the tunnel, the water then ran through an underground conduit into the ancient city of Pythagorio, the city that became known not only for its refreshing mountain water, but for its most famous son, Pythagoras. With engineering and technology in the forefront, it was here that science made a giant leap. Looking for the roots of science, I found myself in Pythagorio on the Greek island of Samos. The city's namesake, Pythagoras, is familiar to everyone who's ever opened a math book because he was a famous mathematician. As a young man, he's said to have met Thales. And like Thales, Pythagoras was an avid observer. But Pythagoras was also a musician. He played the lute, a traditional Greek instrument. Music was and is an integral part of Greek culture. Observation combined with music and math led him to an important insight. Experimenting with a single string, Pythagoras recognized an astonishing relationship. Some people credit Pythagoras as one of the most important men who ever lived. It all started with his famous monochord experiment when he opened our eyes to an astonishing phenomenon. He discovered that the sound of a plucked string correlates to its length, here's the critical bit, in a ratio that can be expressed in numbers. Pythagoras's theory was that there was a correspondence between musical intervals and the length of a string. He connected musical consonances to simple ratios. These ratios represent the different tones in music. Plucking a string produces a tone. By halving the length of a string, that is, by pressing the string onto the metal fret, the frequency of the sound is doubled and the note produced is an octave higher. The ratio of the octave is thus 1 to 2. Pythagoras believed the mathematical order to music was an example of the principle of number which underlies the universe. To Pythagoras, number was a physical quantity discovered by experiment. Order and harmony, beauty and proportion, expressible in mathematical numbers, 
That was the idea of cosmos. Pythagoras believed in it, and many with him, even Einstein. The experiment with the monochord nurtured the belief among the ancient scientists that there was an underlying rule to everything. Pythagoras's thought of harmony extended beyond the cosmos. Beauty was everywhere, and he sought harmony in the underlying principles of everyday life. In his schools across Greece, Pythagoras taught seminars on harmony from within, following the theory of a healthy mind inside a healthy body. Inspired by Pythagoras, I was intrigued with the beginnings of Western medicine as a science, another area where the ancient Greeks led the way. This meant a visit to the Peloponnese, the original home of the Ionians, today an hour's flight from Samos. Asclepius, the ancient god of healing, was the focal point of a cult that swept over Greece in the 5th century BC. Most every town had an Asclepiad sanctuary dedicated to the health of its citizens. The renowned healing center I'd come to investigate at Epidauros was the largest. It was famous for its cures. Whether you were lame, blind, or suffering from kidney stones, this was the place where you'd go. Evidence indicates that sacrifices, prayers, rest, diet, clean water, and fresh air were the main prescriptions. Sounds pretty good to me. Asclepian sanctuaries became the forerunners of our modern health spas. But the ancient Greeks also pioneered the healing power of the mind. The Asclepiads were popular for their psychoanalytic practices. What the shrink's couch is to us was for the Greeks a visit to Epidaurus. This theatre at Epidauros was a famous place to relieve anxiety. Its size speaks to how popular the Asclepiad cult of alternative medicine was. With 15,000 seats, it was almost the size of the theatre in Athens, which at the time was the largest in ancient Greece. Going to the theatre was part of the cure. According to the ancient Greeks, living out your emotions through theatrical performance had a purging effect. The theatre was more than a place of entertainment. It was a place of catharsis. Today, however, coming to Epidauros means sharing one of the acoustic wonders of the ancient world. From 74 feet above the stage, yet I could hear the sound of a pin drop or a match strike. The discovery of how sound waves travel influenced the design of the theatre. And this is how it works. Built into the slope of a hill, 55 rows of steeply banked benches are arranged in a perfect semicircle, 177 feet across. Because sound waves travel in a circular motion like ripples in water, they radiate symmetrically out from the stage. The initial waves enhance later ones as they reverberate off the stone structure. This exceptional capacity for sound reinforcement accounts for the theatre's superior acoustics. Whether exploring the human psyche or building a theatre, the ancient Greeks sought to turn the abstractions of nature into rules that could guide their lives. Diet was a major concern, at least among the upper classes. This was Hippocrates' health formula. Fat people, or those looking to reduce, should do hard work on an empty stomach and then eat rich food while still out of breath from the exertion. One should eat only one meal a day, shouldn't bathe, and sleep on a hard couch. And the most startling recommendation was to walk in the nude as much as possible. All those who wish to gain weight should do the opposite. It's what the ancients knew. What can I tell you? Athens echoes with the achievements of its ancient founders like no other city in Greece. Here, the ancient Athenians built their most sacred temples, lending form to their gods, creating homes for them in stone with an astonishing sense for beauty. While we might appreciate their outward beauty, the ancient Greeks understood that beauty had an underlying formula. They knew the secret to beauty was proportion, which later generations called the golden section. 
Simply put, a straight line is divided into two unequal segments so that the ratio of the whole line is to the larger segment as this segment is to the smaller. This subdivision is called the golden section. The same ratio can be used to create a rectangle as well as a natural spiral when a portion of a circle is inscribed in each section of the golden rectangle. For many, the golden spiral reflects a pattern in nature. The Greeks' insights into ratios led to one of the greatest architectural achievements in the ancient world. The Parthenon was legendary even in antiquity. The Parthenon owes its name to Athena Parthenos, the virgin goddess Athena to whom it was dedicated. Athena was the patron goddess of Athens and also of science and technology. The ancient builders used neither mortar nor cement. These gigantic columns support massive lintels held in place by innovative metal clamps. Arguably, the golden ratio makes its aesthetics so compelling that the Parthenon is a template even for modern architectural design. Although the temple is considered an icon of perfection, I'd heard that the architects and builders had tweaked their design to ensure the impression of perfection just to play it safe. From observation, the ancients knew that a column of the same width, top to bottom, appeared narrower towards the top. To make their columns appear perfectly straight, they tapered them. Using tricks like these, they made sure the temple appeared absolutely perfect. Only an expert could detect the illusion. Professor Tassos Tanoulis, chief restoration architect, agreed to let me in on some of their design secrets such as stairs that were intentionally made thicker in the middle. They were afraid that uh, if they had a straight uh, line for the steel bait, uh, it would, uh, uh, it would uh, seem sunk in the middle uh, with all the weight at the top. That's an optical illusion you're talking about. Optical illusion, yes. Also, uh, it seemed that they thought of each architectural part of the building to respond like a living creature. So, uh, with all the weight of the superstructure, the column has this bulging in order to express the pressure from above. I see. In other cases, let's say, although uh, all the top, all the superstructure, the entablature, as we call it, is leaning inwards, uh, following the same uh, diminution to the top, uh, to, which gives more stability to the uh, volume of the building, each face of the bands, which are the ornaments of the architectural members, are leaning uh, outwards, so mm -hmm. that the design which was painted on it could be seen better from below. Huh. Is each column the same as its neighbor? No, according to the design of the temples or the, the, these uh, Doric buildings, uh, the corner columns are uh, uh, wider, uh, thicker than the inner ones, so that uh, they look stronger because they are at the corners. So what you're saying is really it's not just one optical illusion, it's a whole series of optical illusions. Yes, uh, corrections or optical illusions uh, are everywhere, from the very bottom to the very top of the building. All the temple is curved. I mean, there is no straight line mm -hmm. uh, on this temple. The Parthenon is undergoing yet another round of repairs. Opa. Thanks to the miracle of science and technology, we can still enjoy its glory. Ironically, at around the same time this temple was built, the ancient Greeks also laid the foundation for these modern machines that now restore it. Parthenon is one of the most magnificent structures left to us from ancient times. As I watched the restoration work at the Great Temple, it struck me how much the ancient Greeks contributed to our world. From Pythagoras' discovery 200 years earlier of the correlation between nature and numbers, the ancient Greek scientists had come a long way. Their insights led to Archimedes' discoveries of the principles of mechanics.
Building on proportions and ratio, Archimedes formulated a rule describing how one of the oldest techniques of applying force using a fulcrum and a lever actually works. Archimedes calculated that to move a thousand pound boulder it would take only 55 pounds to do the job. Using a lever 40 units long with the fulcrum in the middle the boulder won't budge. But moving it two units from the rock and putting 50 pounds on the other end balances the lever. Because the ratio of the lever's length from the fulcrum 40 over 2 times 50 pounds equals a thousand pounds. Add five pounds and Archimedes could put his boulder just where he wanted it. What Archimedes' law says is, in essence, the longer the lever, the easier the job. Cranes, pulleys, gears and screws all operate on the lever principle. What Archimedes described was the law of mechanics. In fact, facilities like Piraeus Harbour and others around the world that depend on machines owe an immeasurable debt to his insight. Archimedes was considered the Einstein and the Edison of the ancient world. He became legendary because he inspired the design of ever more complex machines. How exactly the ancient Greeks came to understand the principles of mechanics and physics is a mystery which modern researchers are trying to unravel to this day. In Athens, I visited the second international conference on ancient Greek technology at the War Museum, where scientists and researchers from around the world were exchanging their latest findings. They were all looking for more clues, and so was I. Can you take it? Yes, yes. I will try to It was clear that many ancient machines operated on the lever principle, like this pump whose roots go back to the 3rd century BC, to the Greek Zetsibius the father of pneumatics. It's actually a very powerful pump, isn't it? In this sacred water dispenser, a pivot point replaced the fulcrum, showing how the ancient inventors began to create more complex devices. Meanwhile, Archimedes applied his mechanical principles to a practical purpose. This device is an Archimedes screw. It's a simple but ingenious machine. All it is is an inclined plane here in the form of a plastic tube. As the screw is turned, the plane, the tube, carries water to the top. There it comes. The Egyptians used the Archimedes screw to lift water from the Nile to irrigate their fields. Today, many people think that Archimedes was the first who took the step from simple to more complex machines. Evidence that the Greeks had already developed complex machines began to surface only a century ago. In 1901, a shipwreck was found off the coast of Antikythera, one of the Ionian islands south of the Peloponnese. It revealed for the first time how vast the ancient scope of insights and knowledge must have been. The sculptures found in the wreck were dated back to the first century BC. They reflected an unparalleled level of craftsmanship and artistry. Overshadowed by the beauty of these statues, the fragments of one of the biggest scientific discoveries in ancient history remained undetected until 1976. This amorphous lump was covered with marine growth, but X-rays conducted in 1993 revealed complex gear wheels inside. With a mechanism this old, the big surprise was that there were gear wheels at all. They weren't supposed to have been invented until some 1500 years later. So this insignificant looking piece turned out to be one of the greatest technological finds ever. Corroded and crumbling after being submerged in seawater for 2,000 years, its dials, gear wheels and plates have presented scientists with tantalising questions. One of these scientists is Michael Wright, a British researcher who had built a replica which he introduced at this conference. This is an extraordinarily um, complicated machine, but what does it do? Well, according to me, it's a planetarium. Remember, this is a, a time when people thought of the Earth as the center of the universe. It shows the places of the sun, the moon, and the five planets that they knew about um, in the sky. 
uh, and the back dial has supplementary information which is useful, such as counting off the gears. Right. Is it as complicated as it looks? How many, how many gears are there? How many moving parts does this have? That's into hundreds. I can tell you uh, for a fact, there is, I've got 76 gear wheels in here. 76 gear wheels, and that's an exact replica of the original? The original, I, I find 31 wheels in, right. in what's left. Mm. But you have to understand that um, in making, making sense of what is left, you have to add a lot more. Right. It's, it's terribly badly wrecked. I see. You've disassembled it for us and it's in a complete mess all over the table, so I'm sure you're going to dread this question, but can we see it moving? Uh, yes. It? <laughs> uh, well, you'll see it moving as I put it back together, right. first of all, but uh, I'll put it back together. It took him nearly 20 minutes to put it back together. But it was thrilling to see this 2,000-year-old instrument in working order. This is the moon, which we've now got to adjust. Yes. The, the sun and the moon are together now, so that should be new moon. Uh -huh. So we should see it as wholly black. Like that. May I, uh, please, have a go? My guess. I love that uh, lunar mechanism there. It's beautiful. Well, it? Here's the moon going round fast. Yeah. Uh, and its phase showing here. Here's the sun pointer. Um, below the sun pointer is the day pointer working on the calendar. They go almost together, but sometimes one first, sometimes the other. And then there's Mercury just going ahead of the sun. That's the Mercury pointer. Here comes Venus un under the sun pointer. There. Yeah. Uh, and over here, we've got Mars, Jupiter, and, and Saturn uh, all coming together. It's a very special day. Jupiter's aligned with Mars. The inventor of the Antikythera mechanism is unknown, but others before him had already attempted to build a model of the heavens as a machine. In fact, records indicate it was again Archimedes who built the first planetarium. Unfortunately, all that remains is this 18th century etching called Rowley's Orrery, suggesting what his invention might have looked like. Compared with the knowledge and devices available at the time, Archimedes' idea was light years ahead. Finding practical solutions was one thing, but asking daring questions was quite another. Who was going to provide the answer if the gods no longer could? It was one thing to say that Apollo pulled the sun across the horizon, and quite another to ask why ships float. In their quest to understand the environment, the ancient Greek scientists were intrigued with the question of why some objects float and others sink. If you put a rock in water, it sinks. It will also, in a confined space like this one, tip water out over the edge. What is happening is that the rock is pushing aside its own volume of water. This is called water displacement. Now, if you put a piece of wood in the water, it floats. It also displaces water, but it won't sink. What is happening here? The block and a ship float for the same reason. Although modern ships are made of heavy materials like steel or concrete, they float as long as the ship, or a wooden block, weigh less than the water they displace. The air inside the ship's hull helps lower the overall weight of the ship compared to the volume of water it displaces. This effect is called buoyancy. When Archimedes understood the principle of water displacement, he is said to have run through the streets shouting, Eureka, meaning, I found it. But his legacy was far greater. While Archimedes gave us the fundamental principles from which modern technology is derived, another Greek invention was recently resurrected and tested after being lost for a thousand years at sea. It was a trireme, a warship, renowned for its speed and lethal impact. The sea has always been an integral part of Greek history and culture, because in Greece, no place is further than a hundred miles from the ocean. Much of the country's wealth is attributed to the ancient's ability to master the seas, be it for the purpose of trade and commerce, or for warfare. Zaya Marina in Piraeus, just minutes outside Athens, speaks to this tradition. In ancient times, these yachts would have been warships. 
because this is where the Athenians built and moored their legendary fleet. The National Ship Museum was just around the corner. Recalling different times, the ships that were docked here spoke to Greece's long naval tradition. Along the way, I bumped into an old friend. That says Thales of Miletus. I was looking for the replica of one of their most successful warships. Kept at the Ship Museum among some of the famous vessels of modern Greece is the ship behind me, the Olympias. It's an exact seagoing replica of a trireme, one of the most legendary vessels of ancient times. Ships like these became the pride of the ancient Greek navy and the terror of the Mediterranean Sea. All we know about triremes comes from the playwright Aeschylus, the founder of Greek tragedy. In his eyewitness report, he tells us of the triremes defeating the Persian invaders in the Battle of Salamis, despite being severely outnumbered. No original trireme pieces were ever found, let alone an entire vessel. All that remained was the drama Aeschylus wrote, until archaeologists uncovered ancient trireme storage sheds. We can seat 170 rowers, oarsmen. I had made an appointment with Admiral Ioannis Kolignatis, who had spent five years piecing together the clues to reconstruct this legendary Greek warship. Mm. Yes. Tell me, how did you know how long the trireme should be? Uh, let's start from the length. Mm. Regarding the length, uh, we know the length of the ancient sheds, where mm. the trees were kept and uh, their length could not be longer than what is the length of the set, mm -hmm. which is approximately of the order of 110 feet. Right. The sheds also told them that the ships must have been about 14 feet wide. And the geography of Greece added another clue. Given that triremes landed on beaches, their draft couldn't have been more than three to four feet. But also practical experience gained during the reconstruction process, together with ancient records, helped shape the picture of what the legendary warship must have looked like. What sort of wood did you use to make the boat? The hull is made of uh, pine. Mm -hmm. wood. And in some sele selected places, oak. From the forests of Attica, which were full of uh, pine trees at that period. Right. Pine wood and a shallow keel made the trireme particularly fast and agile, allowing the ancients to skim across the water almost like a hydrofoil. Another crucial source to the secret of the trireme was a list of Athenian naval supplies found in the 19th century. It included 170 oars classified as 62 for the top deck and 54 each for the middle and lower decks, and every oar needed someone to pull it. Sounds like a lot of people in a small place. Can I have a go rowing to see? Yes. How, yeah. Why not? Let's go. Okay. You see how difficult it is to get to position. Sure, it's and very. And you can imagine how difficult it was having 170. Sure, it's very people. cramped, isn't it? Yes, very congested. Now you're going to take one of the top decks. Yes, the difficult one. The difficult one. As I'm a beginner, huh? I'm going to take a middle one. It's actually not so bad once you're in, is it? So you see, I have to have much uh, more inclination to reach the water. Uh-huh. And you are more level. And I am much more to the limit. The way it presumably worked was like this. The trireme had three banks of rowers, hence the name. Each rower hit the water with his oar at a different angle. A galley master would have maintained the rhythm of the oars to keep everyone rowing in unison. And on his signal, the trireme could accelerate like a high-powered dragster. Using all these clues, the Olympias was built. And in 1988, trials were conducted to see if the replica measured up to ancient accounts crew of athletes and professional rowers was trained and took to the waters of the Aegean. 
the trials, how long did it take you to go from a standing start to maximum speed? From a standing start, uh, during the trials we did with the replica, it took 37 seconds. That, and what was the maximum speed that you could get when you had a fully trained crew, all oars, going full steam ahead? From historically the data, we knew that uh, the maximum speed should be of the order of 8.5 knots. And this has been proved also during real trials we carried out with the replica. Mm. And uh, our crew was capable of keeping this speed for approximately half a minute. Then they have no, no, they no more power to keep this really, Then they were this exhausted. Speed. As the test showed, the endurance of the Greek Navy remains legendary. Maintaining an average speed of seven and a half knots, that is roughly nine miles per hour for 24 hours, certainly seems more legendary than realistic. But then again, these were warships and their speed was a matter of life and death. Higher speed meant higher impact and speed was crucial for the trireme's primary weapon, the battering ram. Forged by the ancient Greek metalsmiths, it was used to tear enemy ships in half. It was made of bronze. Having this as a major weapon, mm -hmm. uh, through the ram was exerting a force on the enemy vessel of uh, the order of 65 tons. So all that power, that 65 tons, was concentrated in this point. Yeah, this is correct. Speed and agility made the trireme a devastating weapon and the Greeks masters of the sea. But victory at sea was backed by ingenuity on shore. It was another ancient Greek innovation that provided striking power across the land. The Mediterranean Sea brought prosperity to the ancient Greeks, and it also brought conflict. When Greek settlements on the other side of the Mediterranean were in danger, a quick deployment of the trireme fleets was crucial to maintaining control. I'd heard that some remnants of their innovative solution had survived. To get to this site, I passed through the four-mile-long Corinth Canal built in the 19th century. It cuts across a strip of land that divides the Greek mainland and the Peloponnesian Peninsula. The ancients called this land bridge Corinth of the Twin Seas. The idea for a canal at this strategic point goes back more than 2,000 years to the ancient Greeks. Periander, one of the seven sages of antiquity, was the first to propose it. But in the end, he backed off because he feared it would displease the gods. Next came the Roman Emperor Nero, who actually had a go at it, but he died and the construction was discontinued. Remarkably, the present-day canal follows his plan. I was wondering if Nero expected that he'd have to remove some 420 million cubic feet of rock and dirt to get the job done would have certainly been worth the effort because this passage has always played an important role in Greek history in order to get from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. Armies, commodities and people all had to come through here. But it was way back in the 6th century BC when the tyrant of Corinth, Periander, built the Diolkos instead of a canal. Little remains, but ancient records describe it as a pair of tracks embedded in a paved road that ran parallel to the modern canal. If you'd been here 2,500 years ago, you might have seen 170 oarsmen, each carrying his oar, marching across the isthmus. Meanwhile, their trireme had been hauled up onto the land and was being dragged along this track. The Diolkos served as a shortcut, four miles on land instead of the 250 miles sailing their fleets around the peninsula became a crucial advantage in the ancients' coastal defence. Along the two stretches of the Diolkos that remain, I examine the deep grooves. Often called the world's first railroad, it is unclear exactly how the tracks were used. Whatever the method was, it must have worked well because the Diolkos was in operation for an astonishing 1,300 years, carrying merchant vessels and warships for the greater glory of Greece. For almost as long, another ancient invention helped bridge a giant gap, and while it wasn't a geographic triumph, it catered to the ancient spiritual needs. 
was believed to be the meeting point of two sacred eagles that marked the centre of the world. High on a cliff near Mount Parnassus, the home of the Muses, lies Delphi. Its name derived from the word Delphos, meaning womb or belly. Within the ruins of Delphi's vast temple complex, I found a replica of the Omphalos, the stone that symbolised the navel of the world. But something far more ominous had drawn me here, like thousands of visitors for the past millennia. From around 750 BC, Delphi was world famous for its oracle, a place deep in the temple of Apollo where worshippers could ask the god about their future. Questions were answered by the priests who interpreted the responses of a female vessel through whom Apollo spoke. Surprisingly, modern research has revealed just how much the Delphic prediction relied on a scientific method. It's a little known fact that the priests of Delphi relied on hard data and concrete knowledge. Fragments of information about foreign customs, politics, even the weather were systematised in a sort of interdisciplinary think tank of about 90 priests. They were the best informed people of ancient times, and given enough time, they could come up with an educated guess on just about anything. The answers were ambiguous, yet plausible, and a dash of specifics infused here and there made them downright awe-inspiring. Warriors and kings like Alexander the Great came here for a sign, a hint from the gods about the destiny of their nation. Today, we know they were in good hands. The priests of Delphi were in contact with informants and other priests throughout the ancient world. They even instituted what we today would call the first central intelligence database. They may even have used statistics and calculations. Methods similar to those first applied at Delphi are still in use today. Relying on information instead of the gods, the Delphic priests laid the foundation for systematic data collection. In fact, Delphic oracle forecasting methodology is recognised across the business world today. It's always a bit humbling to realise just how much the ancients knew. It's tempting to look into the future for answers to some of the most persistent questions of science and technology, when in fact there are clues in the past. The ancient Greeks found underlying relationships in ratios and numbers that for all we know may still hold the key to the harmony of the universe. They uncovered the fundamental principles of mechanics that govern our world and established the basics of modern technology. They were the first to ask the crucial question why and to demand a rational scientific answer. In many cases, the answers they provided continue to be the best we have. In ancient Greece, 2,500 years ago, a revolution of the mind made the earth tremble. In so doing, the ancient Greeks opened our eyes, not only to the underlying rules of nature, but to the world and the universe beyond.